On October the 8th, the year was 1918, there was a man by the name of Alvin York who became, for our country, just an American hero. His story was wildly popular. But he didn't start out that way. In fact, he kind of had a loser's life. He was poor. He was drunk most of the time, whittling away his early years in nothing. But at the age of 30, Alvin York was converted to the Christian faith. He believed in Christ as a Savior, and he made some changes. Well, for one, he quit drinking. And then, um, and then he found a beautiful young lady to spend his life with. And so he asked his sweetheart if she would, if she would ultimately marry him. During this time of his life, he didn't have any desire for war. Yet he enlisted in the military to fight in World War I. He just seemed in his mind, his thought, that joining the service and serving his country abroad was just the right thing to do. It was a responsible decision for him to make before he moved on. Well, Alvin York became an American hero for his service to our nation. In the Argonne Forest of France, it was his markmanship that he probably learned from hunting the backwoods of Tennessee as a farmer, that he saved American lives. His patrol, uh, patrol ran into a German machine gun nest. And he set up in a very prime location, and just with his rifle and his pistol, he picked off 25 Germans, ultimately putting so much pressure alone that the German commander surrendered to him and he took 132 prisoners of war in that one skirmish. Well, for his heroic, Sergeant York received the National Medal of Honor. He came back to New York City, this, this Tennessee farm boy, and had a huge parade that was largely in his honor. And yet, he never wanted that glory. In fact, the truth was, he never wanted to even go fight. He was not a fighter, yet... He felt it was his duty, his responsibility as a citizen of our country, and he did, and he was, he was used, and so he would never, never prosper from his fame. After returning from the war, he just went back to Tennessee. He, he married that fiancé that he had professed his love to before going to war. He established a school for rural, rural mountain children and just farmed his land until he died. And that was his life. Friends, what I want to impress upon you this morning is that there is a battle whether you are really a fighter or not. That as a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ, you will wage war against the flesh. And in this battle against the flesh, we, we fight because we have to, not necessarily because we want to. Just like Sergeant Alvin York. With that in mind, take your Bibles and let's go back to Romans 8, where we were yesterday. Romans 8, I want to begin this morning though in verse 9, picking up the narrative and we'll pick points as we go along the way to verse 13. What we did yesterday is we sort of pulled ourselves down or perhaps God's Word pulled, ourselves, pulled us down from the mountain of the flesh where we see that it can't please God. You can follow Paul's progression here in Romans 8. In verse 5, he starts out by just letting you know that you can't live, he uses terms like live according to the flesh, mind set on the flesh. He talks about being carnally minded in verse 6. In verse 7, he describes that type of life dominated by fleshly thinking as at enmity with God and not subject to the law. We found out yesterday that our flesh has inherent weakness so that when it's presented with law in any form, it cannot be successful. It will always fail the law. But ultimately, our weakness in the flesh will lead us to the sinfulness that comes from that weakness. And the, and the end result is in verse 8. So then, those who are in the flesh, here's his conclusion for it. They cannot please God. That's not a way as a Christian that you can live and please the Lord. In fact, 
I think there's a good argument to be made that his whole description here is really in verse 5 through 8 of someone who does not know Christ. By virtue of that, they're living their lives completely in the flesh. Now today, I want to encourage the mountain towards the mortifying sanctification of the Spirit. That God gives you a completely new way through redemption, through conversion, through justification, by the gifting of the Spirit as an indwelling person in our lives to live separate from the flesh and alive to the Spirit. So let's look at that beginning in verse 9. Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... He is not His. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The sanctified Christian life is a massive collection of momentary decisions to die to the flesh and to live in the Spirit. You may have 10 or 12 of those decisions today. Just throughout the course of your day, momentary decisions, you haven't had time to think about them ahead of time or necessarily pray about them. But the general tone of your life and who is dominating your mind, either the flesh or the spirit, will give way to what decision you will make. There will be many of them today. Perhaps tomorrow there could be a dozen or a dozen and a half and on the weekends because we're not encumbered by school and books and responsibilities and practices. You know, I just walked around campus a lot yesterday and noticed you, you have amazingly busy lives. You know, I, I thought it's busy as a pastor. You, you guys, you're here, class, and then you're at practice, and then you, I mean, it's unbelievably busy for you. But on the weekends, there's a little bit more time, and that just gives opportunity for more of these momentary decisions. A sanctified Christian life is going to be one that you're making those decisions moment by moment, case by case, dying to the flesh and living to the Spirit. And we must be vigilant in that work. We have to persevere like pilgrim going up the hill of difficulty. Not like formalist and hypocrisy who found what they thought were easier ways around the mountain, not wanting to stay on the narrow way that went up over the precipice. They went to their destruction, either into the forest or into the pasture, but Pilgrim knew that the narrow way only went over the hill. That sanctification would be hard work, toil, effort. And so he goes up, even on his hands and knees, up that hill. You will find it true for your life as well. I found this to be true in my life, that even when you graduate from a Christian high school or a Christian college, marry a Christian guy or gal, when you, you're still going to struggle with these moment-by-moment -moment daily decisions to live in the Spirit. John Owen, one of the 17th century Puritans, writes in The Mortification of Sin and Believers. It's a great devotional aid for you in addition to the Scriptures on this issue, he writes several things, and here are some of his, his momentous expressions you may have heard. He says, Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always as it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. He will later write in the same book, When sin lets us alone, then we can let sin alone. When it loosens its grasp upon our souls and our minds and our bodies and our flesh, then we can leave it alone. Until then, we must do what Owen is encouraging us and what the Apostle Paul is encouraging us in verse 13 when he says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live in the Spirit, you will put to death. That's the word mortification. And so the Spirit is divinely enabling us 
to use the mortifying sanctification work. What God has done, we can enact and live out in our lives. And it can be achieved. We can live a sanctified life. Not totally free from sin, but certain prospects of discipleship and growth and maturity and faithfulness and Christ-likeness, those can grow. Those can mature in your heart. You can win those momentary battles. You can win them here on this campus. You can win them in the secular world when you go into it. You can win them in your home. You can win them in the church. Your soul, your life can be lived in the Spirit. But it's all based on what God does to divinely enable it. And let me give you two things that He divinely enables. The first one is what God divinely enables, or you can word the, use the word accomplished, what God accomplished in Christ Jesus. The second one is what God accomplishes in us. Divinely enabled, what God has done and is doing is bearing fruit in our Christian lives every day. The first one is what He's accomplished in Jesus Christ. This is listed for us in the first four verses of the chapter. Let me go through them quickly. There are three things I want to highlight out of those four verses. The first one is that God accomplished in Christ making us free from the law of sin of death. He, he makes something efficacious to us in verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of the sin of death. So what we discussed yesterday in chapel, if you're thinking, I have failed so often and I'm currently failing so miserably when I'm surrounded by Christians in chapel five days a week, listening to Scripture, having people pray for me and encourage me. If I'm failing now, I will never succeed out there. The hope and the encouragement for you friends is that Christ has made us free from that law of sin and death. You're either going to trust in your own efforts to make you holy, or you will trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross to justify and then consequently sanctify, ultimately to glorify what your life will be. This is the work Christ has done for us. Number two, God also accomplished in Christ, according to verse 3, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now this is a little more nuanced, but this last expression in verse 3. Right in the middle of the verse it says, God did not did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What we fail to do in our flesh, what all the Old Testament saints failed to be able to accomplish in their flesh, God fulfilled, God did, God succeeded by sending His own Son in the likeness of flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. A reference to the actual body of Jesus Christ, that He condemned sin in the flesh. This is a detailed explanation of life in the Spirit. It's just a magnification of what Paul has already written in Romans. You're probably right there in your Bible, but look back in chapter 7. Look at verse 6. Romans 7, verse 6. What shall we say then is, or verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law. Doesn't, doesn't that sound very similar to what he says in chapter 8, verse 2? Yeah, he's continuing the same theme. It's almost as if he plants this seed in Romans 7, 6, and then he just blows it up with explanation in the 35, 39 verses of chapter 8. Now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, sin itself found its death in Christ. So ultimately, our lives will be perfectly sanctified when Jesus comes to conclude that work in His return. And then the third thing that God accomplished in Jesus Christ is that He promises life to our bodies. It's in verse 10 and 11. I don't want to skip it. This idea that Christ in us, that our bodies are dead to sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And he speaks of Christ's own resurrection in verse 11 to say to you that you will long for your resurrection someday. Now, I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you're in college because you're kind of at the peak you know, of your physical life. The early 20s are great years. I remember reading in one of the men's health magazines that the, t the chief age for a man physically is 25 years of age. So I remember, I was already married at 25, but I remember 
throughout that year just reminding my wife Sarah, listen honey, I'm glad you married me. These last four years have been beautiful, wonderful in marriage, but I hope you get a good look because this is, this is the peak of what I'm capable of. You can look at me, this is as good as it will possibly get. She just rolled her eyes and walked away. Thankfully, she's faithful to the vow she has made. But, but, but 25, they said, that's it. You're your best at 25. And then it is a slow death decline of the body and the health. It's how it rolls. And you will feel the effects. You'll feel it in your 30s. And you'll feel it in your 40s. And you can ask your professors how good it feels later on in life. I pastor a local church, and we have every demographic and age group. And especially when I first went to the church, there were a lot of great Christian saints who were wonderful Christian people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, many in their 90s. One of our members is 103 right now. And so I visit with them, but, but I see their struggle. So one of the joys of pastoring a local church has convinced me that how much I may enjoy life in the flesh, be it eating, exercise, marriage, whatever the issue is that I enjoy things in the flesh, I know that those things are fleeting. That they will fail me. That my eyesight has already begun to fail me. That there'll be a day when your voice will fail you. That your motor skills will fail you. That your mind will fail you. And what Paul is saying here is, look to Christ and what He has accomplished in His death, but has achieved victoriously in His resurrection. So if you don't like what you have, and you don't like what you possess in your body, the hope in verse 11 is, that He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. That your body will be renewed. That sin's effect will be reversed and glorification will come. And as good as we can imagine it, Scripture gives us our imagination to know it will be even better than that. Because our bodies will be like Christ's body. To enjoy it. Through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's a... That's an inheritance, a hope that is there for us. So God has accomplished these three things for us in Christ Jesus, which means what God has done for us in our Savior is sufficient for salvation and even sanctification. What is left are the effects to be carried out in our lives. That in the meantime, between justification, which... Verse 1, verse 39, it's there leading to sanctification. What is left are the effects for us to do our best to depend upon the Spirit to be divinely enabled to grow in holiness, to grow in our knowledge of Christ and our obedience to the Scriptures that He has given, which leads to the second thing I want to declare for you. Not only what God has accomplished in Christ Jesus, which is foundational and primary, but number two, what God accomplishes in us. Notice back in verse 4. The text does not say, we fulfill the law's righteous requirements. That's not what it says at all. It says, because of what Christ has done for us, the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So who is doing the fulfilling here? So we could have a great discussion and argument, perhaps... Some of you are weighing those in your own mind yesterday and today. How much of it is my, my, my divinely enabled toil and effort? How much of it is the presence of the Spirit in His indwelling? Those are certainly necessary. But certainly what is accomplishing, God is accomplishing, is being fulfilled through the gift of the Spirit who comes to indwell. You cannot run away from Paul's tone in his refrain from verses 9 to 13, that this is coming about because the Spirit dwells in you. He dwells in you. He's taken up residency in you. If you have been justified and redeemed, the Spirit is there to enable sanctification to be done in your life. So justification, when the Spirit comes in to indwell at salvation, it must lead to sanctification. And even if you don't make much progress in your life here, if you genuinely know Christ and the Spirit is there, Christ will do His work in you. It will be done. It will be completed. Even if the full effects don't even come 
until the day in which Christ returns and brings glorification. Paul will make that clear. You could spend your time reading on in Romans 8 and get to verse 30 when he declares to us, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. If he has captivated you with the gospel of Jesus Christ in salvation, he will do the work ultimately to bring you full and complete and holy before His Father, you as His bride. Because He's going to do it for His glory. And in the meantime, what God gives us is the Spirit indwelling us to challenge us to do what, we, what He enables us to do so that we are growing in this progress of sanctification. Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, the year was 1939. Uh, he preached before college students. There were 800 of them gathered at the International Conference of Evangelical Students. It was a gathering of InterVarsity Fellowship. He preached for three nights. In the third night, he preached what most said was his most powerful message of the evening. In which there was somewhat of a even though they would rebuff the terminology, the revivalism feeling among the students that night. And he preached on sanctification from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus. Same author. You hear the overtones, the theology that, that Paul says in Romans as well as 1 Corinthians. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus who become for us from wisdom, from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I mean, why wouldn't God just let us go ahead and make it all about our effort? You know, we'll be holy just by being more faithful, reading our Bible more often, surrendering, going to more Bible conferences and, you know, back in the day, revival services and camps and all those sorts of things. Just keep giving and giving. Why wouldn't God just let it be on our own? The conclusion that he came to, Martin Lloyd-Jones, was because if it was our effort and it was not divinely enabled, Holy Spirit granted effort, then we would claim the glory for our righteousness on our own. We would claim the glory for our sanctification. We would look back and say, look at me, everyone else makes a mess of their lives, but I went to clear water and learned better and I've made my life holy. Oh, you might not say it that overtly, but I promise you, I've pastored long enough to learn. There are many a Christian who has not progressed long enough in sanctification that they really do think it's the work that they are doing. They don't understand that it's the work that God is doing. So Martin Lloyd-Jones, these 800 college students, here's what he says, rattling their cage in the moment in life in which they think they can do everything. He says to them, and I quote on that sermon, you cannot receive Christ as your justification only, then later decide to refuse or to accept Him as your sanctification. You cannot receive Him as your Savior only, and later decide to accept or refuse Him as your Lord. For the Savior is the Lord, who by His death has bought us and therefore owns us. Sanctification is nowhere taught to taught or offered in the New Testament as some additional experience possible to the believer. It must come because the Spirit indwells. And if it doesn't come on our watch, it will come in glorification on His. You say, well, how does that happen? How can you bring that down from a theology which seems so much into the clouds into the momentary decisions I'm going to live today? Here's the point. The Spirit of God implants a heart desire to be sanctified. If the Spirit of God is there. He's, he's wooing you, speaking to you, encouraging you, giving you a sensation and a desire for sanctification to put in the effort to go up the hill of difficulty that's never been there before. That what we used to be required to do becomes desire to do. This is what we would talk about in conversion. Like, when people get saved, there is something that ought to change. There is a radical transformation of life. Let me give you an illustration. One of the brothers who just joined our church two weeks ago, um, 
His name is Brian Reeves, and he was basically homeless in, in Massachusetts, lived kind of in the slums around Boston, moved to our area about 10 years ago, joined our church. He's a, just a wonderful brother. He told me about his, he told me about his, um, his salvation. He said he had a friend who was like an overbearing independent Baptist who was on his back about salvation every day at work, kept giving him tracts all the time. And he said, I didn't want anything to do with these tracts. And yet I read them just to contend with him and poke fun about the tracks. But he said, my life was spiraling out of control. Later he loses his job. He loses contact with his brother that had encouraged him so much towards the gospel. Maybe even a little too much. Later on, Brian said, my whole life was so much in shambles. That, um, that I was driving on the road and all of a sudden I recognized that there was not one last thing I could do to, to save myself, rescue myself. He said, I had actually spent a couple times praying the little prayer that the guy told me on the back of the track to pray, and nothing happened. But he said, in the moment in the car, when I began to pray and tell God I had nothing left, he said, at that moment, there was an overwhelming filling of the Spirit of God in believing in Christ in, in a way that, that I never believed before. And he said, it was at that moment that there was a total transformation in my life. And we're sitting in my office and I'm listening to this and I'm listening how for the next five years he worked at Walmart. And he said, I, I moved out from living with my girlfriend. I broke off that relationship because I knew it wouldn't please God. And I said, Lord, I want a wife, but I want one for the right reasons. So I'm going to do nothing to fix myself up. He said, I'm a single guy. He said, I didn't groom very well. I didn't cut my hair, didn't shave. I didn't care what other people thought. And all of a sudden, there Kelly was working in Walmart with me, and she's pursuing me. After five years, during those five years, Brian saves his money and buys a wedding ring. And he says, Lord, I'm not dating anybody. I just want you to give me the wife you want for me. And Kelly comes and she's asking Brian to go with her on a date. Kind of inverse there a little bit, but that's how it rolled. He said, okay, I'll take, you to, uh, I'll take you to a local church that's showing a film. He wanted her to know Christ so bad, so he took her to a church, and the film was Heaven's Gates, I think, and Hell's Fires. That's a first date, you know, the first date you take her, an unbelieving gal to a movie at a church in a sanctuary, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Fire. They get to the church, and they pick the wrong night. Not a single car in the parking lot. But I said, I didn't know what to do. So I drove to the beach, and we just sat there and we talked for several hours. And I said, Kelly, the only way that our relationship will have any purpose, any value, is if you know Christ as your personal Savior. And through a series of events of starting to going to church together, over the next couple of weeks, Kelly herself came to Christ. They were married. And then he began to open his Bible in my office, and he pulled those three gospel tracts out of his Bible. And he said, I never loved or appreciated that man giving me that witness in such a weird way, in his view, until my life was converted to Christ. You see, what God is accomplishing in us is a transformation. That the Spirit of God implants in our hearts a desire to be sanctified. I can't give that to you. I can't preach that into you. A desire for holy living because you have too many options, too many moment-by-moment -moment decisions to either crush the flesh and believe the Spirit and live in the Spirit. Too many options for you. Your parents cannot domineer you and control you in this way. The Spirit of God, by His indwelling, must convert what you possibly now think as a require to into a desire to. So that sanctification is not by surrender. It's by divinely enabled toil and effort. Paul concludes his thoughts. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. So he says in verse 12, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Christians, if you want a reason to mortify the flesh, to put it to death, if you want a, a motivation from the Spirit of God for your holiness, so that it has its full effect, you know, 
2 Corinthians 7, 1, that this perfecting holiness, it, it's coming about in your life. If, if you want something, choose to live. Choose to live that by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the body, life will come to you in a way that is unimaginable. It's one of the things that led me into ministry in the first place. Perhaps it needs to lead some of you to seminary after your education here. I talked to Edward yesterday. I said, Edward, we're actually working. I'm, I'm here working. This is like work hours for me. Who in the world gets to have fun working like this? It's fantastic to live in the Spirit and do what Christ has called you to do. It's a great joy. Then the result, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, verse 14, these are the sons of God. These are the sons of God. It, it will bear itself out. I don't have to find you out. I don't have to search you out. Neither does anyone else. It doesn't have to be based on how the deans evaluate your life. What Christ is doing, what God is doing by the Spirit, is as many as are led by the Spirit of God, you will be found out to be a son, a child of God. Kevin DeYoung, who's written a good book called The Hole in Our Holiness, just recently. He says, God motivates us by our holiness, motivates us to holiness by reminding us what we were in sin, what we are in Christ, and what we will be in glory. He does that in Romans 8. What I'm encouraging you to do, go do it. Go with divine enablement by the Spirit and kill the flesh and enjoy, revel in, have satisfaction in living in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray what the Puritans would have said in the Valley of Vision. Grant us, Father, never to lose the sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, and the exceeding wonder of grace. Thank you that it is by the Spirit, based on the finished work of Christ, that Father, in 39 verses in this chapter, there is not one imperative. Thank you for it being enabled by your gifting of the Holy Spirit of God. May we be faithful to bear those effects in our very lives today. I pray that for my friends, these students, the staff and the faculty here at, here at Clearwater. And I pray it for my own life and my own family. Lord, do this work for the glory of Christ, I pray. Amen.